Last week we went to, into this. We were, had, had three parts to this presentation. The first was the early years up through the Hanoi March, and then the man's inhumanity to man, and then next week we'll be covering the good guy era on that. But right now we're going to get started as a recap on what we did last, last week, very short, for those people who might uh, who weren't here last week. I know there were a couple in the audience. But anyway, we went through the period of time where Ho Chi Minh started this thing in 1923, got trained in the Soviet Union, like that. And then our politics in our, this country was dominated by a fear of encroaching communism as things were getting worse and worse around the country. And they thought they were worried, worried about things like the domino effect, <coughs> what would happen if one nation fell to influence the, what would happen in another nation and such, such like that. And then I went through my history, how I became a fighter pilot, I had spent 75 missions in the Korean War in air-to-air -air combat, and then got to the Pacific Theater in the F-105 in a air-to-ground war, a bomb, essentially a tactical bombing mission. And that ended up with me being a prisoner of war, as I talked in the last session. And we had the early days of the captivity, which was not good, but not excess excessively bad. Until the, PO, until the Hanoi March, which in my estimation, in my history, was the turning point. Now, some of the other guys that were captured around the same time or after I was captured, they might have gotten into real bad treatment earlier than I did. But anyway, we went into this situation here, which was the Hanoi March. And we saw the scenes such as this. And I stopped at this scene because there are two guys sit here, this man right here and this man right here. This is Pop Kern, and we'll hear about him. This is Red Berg and we'll hear about him as well. And, whoops, oh, I gotta get, gotta be careful with this other segment. Yes? Okay, just let me stop this. Uh, it, in just a moment, it, and I'll answer that. Okay, uh, the, the purpose, as far as the Vietnamese uh, stated, was it was a normal day when a group of prisoners were being taken to a place of interrogation. And as I explained, there was nothing normal about this whatsoever. It started out early that morning, when they took a set of our pajamas away, put stencil, stenciled numbers on them, and then brought them back, took us out in the late afternoon, tied our sandals to our feet, because they knew we were going to be doing the march, and then took us downtown Hanoi, started us out from a side street into the main street, where there was a whole bunch of people there, quiet, until one shout, and then all what you saw there started to happen. And when they shouted, were they saying they, how much they needed? A lot of it, uh, if you can hear, you can possibly hear the word me, which is M-Y, uh, me, and that's American. Oh. That's American. Let's see if I can get this back. <laughs> okay. Okay. We lost it there for a bit, but I couldn't get it. 
You notice the guys with the, the rifles there? Some of them are on the inside toward us, some of them are on the outside. Those guards were scared. You know what's happened? That's Popcorn Redberg. And there I am with uh, Larry Garino. And you'll hear a lot about Larry. But let's go to further than this. After the, that march and we were brought into the stadium, we were then in trucks taken back to the camp. That's where all hell started anew at that point. We were handcuffed in pairs to, to trees around the central cut courtyard. I showed you, a, a, I believe, a, a site of the zoo, which is a, an old I think motion picture camp where they had, had a lot of buildings and they had storage for film and such as that, that they adopted for a prisoner, a prisoner of war camp. In the center of that was a, a euphemistically, I call it a pool. It could, you could also say it was a cesspool. But they also raised uh, water greens in it and they fed us the water greens from, from that cesspool. Around that pool was a number of trees, and they handcuffed us to those trees, small diameter, maybe anywhere from two and a half to four or five inches in diameter. And we were left there for several hours, completely blindfolded. Intermittently, those guards would come by, and they would uh, treat us not favorably, uh, hitting us, punching us, kicking us, trying to get into the crotch and like that. The next day, after two hours there into our rooms, things started getting a little bit, not a little nasty from the guards. No overt things happened right at that point to us, doesn't mean to Larry and myself, but they did as they say, whoops, hit the wrong side. The next day, we got the taps from that Pop Kern. Now, Pop Kern was a man probably a little bit older. Uh, Larry Garino was probably about oh, five or eight years older than I, and Pop Kern was about the same, uh, same age as Larry, and he was a, a gunner in B-17s in World War II, had been shot down and was a prisoner of the Germans. When he came back, he went through pilot training, and now he got shot down in North Vietnam. He got tortured pretty fiercely, and he went to Larry and wanted to turn himself into treason because he had given in to torture and had written a confession to war crimes, that he committed war crimes, and he begged the forgiveness of the Vietnamese people. And so that Larry spent two hours on that wall, topping back and forth, trying to bring Pop back letting him know that he did everything that we could expect it. He tried to refuse the enemy, the propaganda. It just didn't work. So now for us, things are going to get bad because it's beginning. That evening, Larry and I and the Pop Kern's uh, teammate, the guy that was beside him in the march, Red Berg, we were taken in, in a vehicle to downtown Hanoi, back to the Hanoi Hilton. We were put into HBH at that time. You saw the HBH before. It's that, it is that, uh, that section right in there. This time, instead of being in building in number four, as I was before, we were now in number two and Red was in number one. Okay. Weren't there, for, for, were there overnight, but then the next night, boom, we got right outside the camp, out, the, out that door, and uh, right up in here, over in here, across the street, was a building. I think it was probably a justice building of some kind, but it was a fairly uh, big building, uh, fairly open to, to have it nice and cool in the bad weather and such like that. But it seemed to be, uh, it was populated with furniture and all like that, but empty of people. They had cleared it for, for the 
the thing. But we were taken to different rooms in the building and then put into, into torture at that time. Now, the, the three separate rooms, we, I could hear the shouting, screaming in another other room. To this day, I don't know if I screamed, if I shouted or like that, but I do remember that my squadron commander, and I told you about him last week, Robbie Reisner, the guy who got shot down, had the helmet that was identical to mine, except for the name on the back. So he, it, he wrote at one time, he said, I could hear the screaming, and I could hear it, and I was wondering where the screaming coming, was coming from, and then I realized that it was me. It was that, it's that kind of a way. When you get into that kind of a situation, you can so detach yourself that you'd be in different places all at the same time. Now, this is the rope trick. If you notice up here, this really is the rope trick all by itself. This is combining two things up there. Could you help me up here at a moment? What they did was they took and put rope around, the, around your the elbows of the upper arms and then pull those things together. Would you to do that? Start to pull my... Pull yours together? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Pull together. Yeah, keep... <laughs> now, you see how far my elbows are apart there? Well, actually, thank you, that they can get that to where your elbows touch. And when they do that, it pulls with a fulcrum of your chest, and like that, pulling out on, on your shoulder, it tends to pull your whole doggone uh, shoulders out, out of joint. So, and that, but the pain that you experience, while really, really bad, is also progressive. It gets worse. And some of, the, uh, some of the guards, and one in specific, specifically we call straps, because that's what he used. He used straps instead of ropes. And he would put you on your side and put straps around you, then just start pulling. And if it wasn't going as well, he could put a foot on the, on the upper, on the upper uh, arm like that and start pushing them together while pulling with the other one, getting worse and worse. I don't know how long I lasted, but I finally had to give up. And so I had to accede to their wishes, which were a mission of crimes to thank the Vietnamese for the kind and humane treatment. That's what they wanted written. We left there headed for a place we call the Briar Patch. We stopped through the, at the zoo where we had left, picked up some more people, and then, tended, then headed out about 40 miles out into the countryside toward their western border, or toward Laos. And so from Hanoi out to the border is something like 100, 120 miles, depending upon where you are in Vietnam. Now, it's, Briar Patch, as far as I knew it, was a, a series of small buildings. Each one of these is a building. They were the four cells eat in each one of those buildings. Larry and I were, were whoop, well, let me go back to this. Let me go over there, we go. Larry and I were in this building right here. The six square, essentially square buildings, these three rectangular buildings, the main uh, interrogations and quizzes were always here. The main torturing, as far as I was concerned, was in this one. And I don't know for sure what that one is. I think they may have had some other prisoners of war there as, as well. But Larry and I were in, in that building number two. The interior of, of that, as you can see, is that there were two bunks on the side. And let's take a look at the, so essentially a seven by nine feet. 
the uh, these bunks they're a little big in this one, but essentially two and a half by maybe six feet this way lays about a oh maybe a two foot uh, space in between, and then it's a little space at the here where your sanitary bucket would be back there, and that's your that's the way in and out. So when you went in and out, you had this partition on both sides. They so you couldn't see any place else on that. And when the guards wanted to, to look in, they looked in through this window, which was a barred window and something. The interior had been, uh, well, the, instead of like a stucco finish, what they took was, was cement and just threw it against the wall until you had a lot of knobs of concrete sticking out. So if you leaned against it like that, you could get really scratched or like that. To inhibit communication, it's pretty hard to tap on a wall like that. We found a way to do it, though. We had communication between those uh, four buildings. Then, two weeks later, up there in the in that remote area, the 40 miles out of town, and when you're that far out of town in Vietnam, with the lack of transportation they had, that was the distance. They got a they got a word. They were cleared now to do torture for propaganda. So we just got there two weeks too soon. We had already been through it, but now we're going to go through it again. A new brand. So this time they took ratcheting handcuffs, you know, the kind that you see with the police on all the time, but instead of putting it around your wrist, they put it around your, your forearm. And then they took the, those ratchets and squeezed them as hard as they could and kept on squeezing and squeezing, yet click by click, actually starting to bend the bones in, in your forearm together. Instead of being separated, they started to move together. That again was a very hard thing to, to handle, and it was also a progressive pain. The pain just kept increasing. And after going through torture, the, the rope trick then in Hanoi, and two weeks later going through these, this handcuff treatment, this is how we pretty well looked. If you take a look, this was the thing for the handcuffs, and this would be where the ropes went on. Now, Mike McGrath is the guy who put it, and he's, he's the guy showing right there. He was a Navy pilot and skilled at doing sketches, except he just couldn't make himself make us the, the way we actually looked. It, I think that guy is in, in pr fairly good condition, good muscles and like that. We weren't. So he didn't show how we actually looked. That's the only problem I have with Mike's uh, art. The condition of the food there, it started to worsen. It wasn't good to begin with. It started to get a little bit worse. And then several months later, they came up with auxiliary power, and now they had the propaganda box. And that was a, a mixed blessing. We got some amusement out of it. But uh, some of the guys, when they would go on that box, and they would read whatever they needed to read, they'd, uh, they'd have a, a a blurb that had the, the president's name, Ho Chi Minh, and, the, and we would be listening to the bitch box and it would come out, Horseshit Minh. <laughs> so if the Vietnamese were skilled in the language and had heard that, those guys could have been killed on the spot, without a doubt, because to them, he was an idol. Uh, then, later on, they started to get worried about possible airstrikes. So they dug trenches in the fall and winter of 67, a five foot deep trench. Maybe they used uh, POWs to do it, I don't know, Larry and I would not, but they came out, out of the, right by our hut, that number two, down through the hillside, and that was about five feet deep, and then they put off the, the, the main trail, they put these well, boxes, essentially. They would, the boxes were about five, four by four foot square 
with a hardwood door on the front of it and only about five foot tall. And when we we were dragged out of that a number of times, and that along that trail they had fire ants. And it, so the guards would would take the two of us and put a rope around our neck and and lead us down through those trenches until they got to the box they wanted to put us in. Well, that those uh, boxes, I believe, at sometimes at Designed as air raid shelters, yes, but I, they were used by the Vietnamese as punishment pits, so they could take guys out. Fortunately, Larry and I didn't have that problem. But along with those trenches, they also dug the floor out underneath our bunks. So they had a, a pit down there that if there was a drill or an air war warning, we were expected to get down there and be underneath it. So actually, we would have been in, in fairly good shape. We were down there underneath a hardwood uh, plank bed above us and down, to, down below ground. But there was no place to walk. So what Larry and I, I did, we, we walked on top of the, uh, of the bunks, going around, stepping over that two-foot space between the two of us, just making a, a turn. That's essentially a real small circle, but we got some exercise that way. In late January 67, I think they probably started getting uh, tired of that camp being so far out of Tain because we saw that the pitch boxes were now starting to be removed, which was no, no uh, problem for us to get that out of the way. But it seemed as though they were going to shut down the camp and we were taken back to the zoo. This time we were going to another building that we hadn't been in before. And so that was in what we call, or I call the library. Some people call it the office. And went into a room in the back, it, 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 actually in about the, that, that last corner right there. And what they had is going down had a fairly large center section to that building. And on the left and right, they had two long halls that went down about halfway into the building, then took a hard left turn as far as we were concerned. So what the, what, whoops, let me get rid of that, get this thing. So we would go down this hall there. On the hall, they had a, a, a plank, uh, uh, planking where they put our, our food. And then right at the end of the hall was a, a door into a very small cell, and then turned left, and that was into our cell. And on the front of our cell was another one. Well, need to get through that because built in the room, Larry wanted to do some exercising, and I was walking around the the room and it's just continual walking around, just trying to get uh, trying to get my blood going, get some something going. So Larry jumped up on his bunk and started running in place. In about 20 minutes, the door flew open, and about 10 10 Vietnamese came in. They grabbed me, pulled me outside. They grabbed Larry, Larry stuck him on his bunk and put him in irons. They thought that all that running was communication and they were punishing him for it. So they put him in, in these leg irons. Now, this one shows, shows the leg irons this way, but what they actually did was they, they took at, at the, on these two stirrups there, they pulled them aside, one to each side, and roped them at each end of the board. So we spread eagled on that. And then handcuffed him behind with the same uh, ratcheting handcuffs that we had before. It left him that way. And I had to feed him. I had to take care of him in, in every kind of way on the thing. But after several days of that inability to really lie down, relax, do anything, he was reaching his limit. Well, the guys that were in that, that former, that forward room, I saw it, they would clear the area, and the guy in the small room would also 
but what are we going to do about the handcuffs? So the guys in that forward room had found a small nail, bent nail, and in that hallway they left it in, in, the, uh, in the, the, some of the food bowl, which is a, a, a sewer green, I believe, bowl. It was a, some kind of green, it left an oil slick on the top of it. Uh, whether it was nutritious or not, I don't know, but we lived through it. But anyway, I found that nail. And after a while, I was able to pick Larry's cuffs. And, after, and we worked on it for a while until he could pick them as well behind his back. And so he was able to get at least one cuff, cuff off of him like that. And with that, he could relax and lay down. At the same time, I put the net over him like that. So it would be if, if the guys that were trying to clear for us missed it, missed the guy, we'd still be able to get it. So we, we did the picking, and there's the guy at the, at the end of that hall, that long hall, and that's how he cleared us. He, was, he would be down there for hours to give Larry a relief, just laying down there. If anything came along like that, I'd hear that. And Larry would immediately put his cuffs back on, and like that. It went on, on that way for, for a couple of weeks. But the Vietnamese, they never keep, keep at things. In, in May, we moved over to the barn. Now, I had told you I had been to the barn before. I had been. I had been about in the center. But this time, they moved Larry and me to this end room, right there, number one. Like that, that go, barn goes from, there are seven rooms in that, that place, seven cells. So we were back at, in, in that, but, and it, since, as you can see, if you're communicating like that, from here, from there, it's pretty, this is an end of a building, and how do you talk, how do you communicate with all the other buildings that we had there? Well. We were at the end of the end of the line, and he was the senior man in the camp. He didn't have any communication. At that time, we had recognized, and I'd gotten enough information to know that Larry was the senior ranking officer in that entire camp, camp from the POW population, and that's why they were interested in, in us. He, they knew he was a senior. They knew they had to interrupt cut off any kind of communication or any kind of organization that we might uh, put on. One day I was told by Dum Dum that we had an interrogator that we named him Dum Dum because he was so dumb he must be double dumb. <laughs> I mean, he was really bad. <laughs> but, uh, but he says, it's, he told, uh, told me, he says, says we're going to get another prisoner in there with us, a third man with it. That would, I mean, two guys alone, get a third one, that would be pr pretty good. But I had to pr permit the camp regulations, so I stated, I permit the camp regulations. Now what the hell does that mean? I don't know, but that's, that's what he accepted, and Fred Cherry walks in. So there we are, th three guys together. Now Fred had been an F-105 pilot also, he, had, he was stationed in Japan. He had flown out of a different uh, base in Thailand than Larry and I did, but we had a lot of things in common on that. But they decided they got to go through this com communication again, go after it again, the communications purge. So after in August, they moved us out to this little tiny hut now, we were here at the end of communication, over to here, where there's not just about any, nothing at all, because this is that hut, and there, there we are, this is the room we were in, this was blocked off, two beds there, and a third one in the middle for Fred. This was a wide open space that they didn't use. But as you see, the sight lines that we had going out of cracks like that, you could see there, there's the end of that building. This was the building in, in the barn number one where we had been. There's not, nothing there to see, nothing to communicate with like that. So 
in that little that hut, we were receiving three cigarettes a day. Now, Larry and I were not smokers, but we knew that someday we'd get the guy that was a smoker, so we accepted the cigarettes. If you if you started refusing them, you would never get them again. So we accepted them. So they gave you. Uh, at uh, three times a day, a guard would come by and give you a cigarette. Three of us there, you got three cigarettes and one, one light, okay? Those cigarettes, looked, as you can see, it says Trung Son on the side of it, right, right there, Trung Son. They were some of the world's worst cigarettes. If, if you didn't continually drag on the cigarette, it would go out. And so you, when you got your light, you had to smoke it, and you had to finish it. Otherwise, there would be no light until the next time around. Well, Fred would always take that first, first light. He's the, he's the thing. And then one of us would take a light from him and keep the light going so he could get the third. Poor Fred. Uh, Larry, as I said, is type A personality. Talks all the time. As I said, he talked about things like fine Italian food and things like that. I mean, it, the torture from the Vietnamese one thing, but torture from Larry was another, <laughs> like that. But Larry would take his light from Fred, and he'd, he'd be just standing there, and take his dragon, and he'd, go, he'd have to keep on talking to you like this, and his hand is going up like this. And, uh, and I see Fred there. His, like a dog looks at a tree, Larry, uh, Fred didn't take his light, uh, his eyes off that light because he was afraid it was going to go out and he was going to lose his second cigarette. <laughs> it, it was hilarious. But anyway, we got this, <laughs> he got his two cigarettes a day, and we spent several weeks there getting uh, quizzes, interrogations, while they were trying to home in on the communication. They decided we were not co complying with what they wanted. We had to be public, uh, punished like that. So the punishment was going to be put in the leg irons. Now, I showed you the irons before, but instead of manacled handcuffs, these were wrist irons. Those were straps of iron when they did put together like a stocks, like you put in stocks that in the old days where you see the, the pilgrims and stocks, our hands would be in that. There was no way of doing that. The, the way to get out of you was a recessed screw at one end of that thing where it screwed in. You couldn't get to it to unscrew it. Once those manacles were put on, they were on, you couldn't get them off. And these Things that were built for small wrists, ours were larger wrists than, than that, so they were, real, were really uncomfortable on that. Now, Fred, I didn't tell you about this before, but when he got shot down in his 105, he blew the canopy off, and, and when it did, he had a whole bunch of uh, charts and maps right on top of his instrument panel there, and the, the ensuing wind operation started blowing those things around and out and he went to grab them and as he did his his left hand hit the the slipstream at probably at about 450 miles an hour and it threw his arm out and threw his shoulder out of joint so he arrived in Hanoi with a completely out of joint shoulder he just Fred was a black and as a black, they were going to do the, see if they could get something from him, for, you know, against the white American uh, imperialists. But so they were took him in, and they they didn't touch him for about three or four weeks. And of course, at that time, everything starts to re-pull in, and there was no way they were going to be able to pull that shoulder back and enjoy it. It had to be done surgically. So they took it to a hospital and they actually put it into, sur into surgery and they put it into, into, uh, into place. But the, 
the doctors moved out and the corpsman, whoever it was, was putting him in the cast. When he put him in the cast, he took the Fred's arm, I'm going to show this dirty American, or yanked his arm up and put him. What they did, instead of being in the cast like that, they moved it half in, half out. About two weeks later, Fred heard a pop and the thing had gone out again. Well, things started to get really bad, and his entire shoulder started getting infected. When Fred was with us, I could see a, uh, can I borrow your cup a moment? Uh, there was like the in inside ring of there, right at his shoulder point, there was a, an open spot there that I could see no skin, but there was flesh underneath. So, and I could see fluid there. Now, I guess that's lymph fluid or whatever. I don't know what, to, what that is, but it wasn't, it wasn't bleeding. It wasn't infected, but there was no skin over it, off of it at all. And he was starting to lose the, the bone at the end of this, of this bone and the end of the, the bones in his shoulder. So he was not in good shape. There's no way that they could put Fred into those, into those irons and to the cuffs behind his back. So Fred was taken out to some place, parts unknown. We didn't know at that time. The presence, that punishment with, that, with those kind of irons, the irons were at night, came off during the day, but the uh, leg irons were left on all the time. Five months for me, eight months for Larry. The CFT, I'll explain that. After several months, I was brought out, Larry too, saw what was advertised to us as a health professional, a, a doctor or a medic, we didn't know what it was. But he told me, well, I better, better uh, behave, do everything that they wanted of me, answer all their questions, write whatever they wanted, because I was close to death. That's what, what he told me. I don't think I believed him, but I returned back to that hut again, put right back into irons, like that. And my, my thing to Larry was CFT, cleared for torture. So, and indeed, the next day, Larry and I were both put through the rope trick again. That same thing. Only this time, I was put through it twice, Larry was put through it four times, but we never, never broke. We found out you can learn to take torture. Each time, you do a little bit better than the last time. Well, they didn't get anything from us. I really believe that the, the guy was to, that started this whole thing really didn't have the authorization, because if they wanted to, they could press on and get, get what they wanted. But, they let us go and going back. So, returned to hut, hut long enough to get my things and out of that, and I'm going to leave leave Larry alone there. Because right now I'm going from from that hut down there to the very end of the the other end of that barn, like that. Now, so that's room one where I was, and then I I get word. And that's the solitary. I'm in there 24-7 for a week, let out of the irons, only a time enough for, for food. I found that even with those manacles on, on my wrist, I was able to lie in a twisted fashion. I would lie down and get a few minutes of sleep. But word came from that room number two, next to the, where we had been before, which was our only way of communicating when we were in that number one, that they had broken and they had told the Vietnamese like that. And I was worried that now Larry doesn't, has no way of knowing that. I hear it through the tapping through the wall, even though I'm on the, on the other side of the, of the room from where the wall was to me, to, uh, between me and the next room over, I could hear the taps and I could tap on a, the stanchion that was holding up my bunk uh, to return to communication with them. 
those guys had given, I, I got to get word to Larry Sumboy, how do I tell him that he's, it's, he's bucking a wrong horse right now? Tell them what they want to know because they already know it, like that. So I just, uh, I was then, be, had become the senior man in that building. I told them, while well, they were outside sweeping like that with the tap code, sweep to Larry, LG, give, RB, gave. Larry, give it up because Ron has already given it up. Like that. It's the only way I could think of trying to get through to him. I never had the opportunity to, to, uh, to give, and he never got the opportunity either. But uh, anyway, we're still in the torture. Remained in there nightly for about two months, like that. And Fred Cherry comes back to me this time. Fred does not look good, that good. As I told you, he was sick like that. The irons had been stopped when Fred came in, and Fred was coughing. We had some white bowl bowls, in this case it was a bowl, about oh, five or six inches in diameter or so. I cleaned it out as best as I could, and I wanted him to cough into it, and, and as I thought, he was coughing up blood. So what I think was happening is chips from that broken shoulder were migrating into his lungs like that. So I yelled like crazy, and they came, they checked my bowl when I saw them, they could see the blood there, like that. They fed Fred, Fred an increasing diet. It was nice to see Fred get a lot of food, and I got to stand right there in the same room, including, but he gave me taste of his sweetened condensed milk like that. I tell you, after having had nothing for as long as it's been like that, to have that condensed milk, that was a, a real benefit, even if it was just a taste. But he left and was moved to a place unknown. I don't know. Another month of that, and back to the hut, the hut I go, back in irons. Now, here's, here's a nice one. R remember what I told you, that the, the these stirrups were tied at, at there, like that, with the rest irons behind you. Well, when they had certain things to give out, it didn't make the matter if you were in something like this, unless they were told not to, like that. So I'd, I'm sitting on my bunk, Larry and I, spread eagle just that way, like that, when the, the, the door opens and a guard comes in, with a banana for each of us. So he throws the banana like that onto Larry and to me. Well, my banana went just about halfway up my shorts. And Larry looked at that thing. He almost exploded off, off his thing in laughter. He, <laughs> he said, you can't believe what I'm looking at. <laughs> so, uh, so even in, in situations like that, crazy thing, you get humor yeah. like that. Bananas and irons is how it was. Now we're going to talk about Communication Central because after another month or so, Larry and I are now going to move down to, into another building, the pool hall. Remember, we were in the hut back here. There's the barn, the garage, like that. They moved us over here into number five, like that, a building I call Communication Central because it had sight lines. From that building, they could cut, see at, in places in the barn, in the garage. And they had a guy at one time in the gatehouse. They could see that. They, from the, the showering area, sour bathing area that they had, well, they could communicate over to another one on that building. And in this building here, they had two young studs that were, to, oh, like they were still in their mid to, mid to low 20s. And the guys, one would stand on the shoulders of the other guy to look through the little peephole that was way up at the time. But he had communication there. And from this room, they had communication to there. And 
this, this one didn't exist. It actually was this room here who had communication over to the library. Larry and I were in that room. We didn't have a communication to anybody but the people whose walls we had. So we had direct communication with this number four, number nine, and number 10. Uh, that, so, so after being tortured for communication, we were now in the number one communication uh, place around. So we went from COM0 uh, to COM central, essentially. Uh, that. Now, I've got this. I want you to focus just on that hand. Now, that hand right here is behind a, a screen or something like that. But if you can envision it through a little hole about like this, up the top, there's a hand up there making hand signals, A, B, C. D, E, F, well, uh, rather than do that, I'll show you there. There it is. A, B, C, D, O, D, all the way through. You recognize, as I said before, I don't know why, but uh, that was Q. So, <laughs> but anyway, so we had the communication, beautiful communication. So. The SRO, Larry, went from being out of touch to in command. He could talk, talk to all the people and get information back on like that. So, I think what, what we could do right at this point, let's take a, I'll put that as a, a teaser on there. And let's go for a break. Now we're going to talk about the Cuban program. You say, what the heck has Cuba got to do with this, huh? Well, as it turns out, Cubans people had control of this building and the POWs in it. That's a stable. This is what's in the, the honor bound. From its inception in the summer of 65, the zoo had a reputation of being a pertinent camp on a par with the briar patch where I had been and the nastier aspects of Pueblo, which was the Hanoi Hilton. What has gone virtually unnoticed by the American people is the direct involvement of Cubans in the torture and murder of American POWs in Vietnam. Pretty strong statement. We believe one of the primary objectives of this, if you call it a program, was to determine how much physical and emotional, psychological abuse, agony that a human being can withstand. There were several Cubans that showed up at our camp at the zoo. One of them we nicknamed Fidel, another one we nicknamed Chico, another one Pancho, really just the two of them. Fidel was the main one. He's a, he's a fairly big guy, he's probably six foot tall and thing. I never Thankfully, I never saw him myself. Everything I know, I got through our communication system and what we learned from our guys after, after release and like that when we get together. Because they had these people really under their thumb. We think they were trained in, in Russia, Europe, or wherever. I want to read something to you. This came from uh, John Hubble. He's the senior Reader's Digest editor and the author of the book POW. He describes an ordeal that was about a, a Captain er Earl Cobeal, who was an F-105 pilot. And when Fidel, the Cuban, 
forced him into the cell of a fellow POW, then Major Jack Bomar. Jack uh, retired as a, uh, as a full colonel, as I did. But Jack, Jack was a real nice guy, easy going, easy, one of those people that you really like to know, I thought. Camille could barely walk. He shuffled slowly, painfully. His clothes were torn to shreds. He was bleeding everywhere, terribly swollen, and a dirty yellowish black and purple from head to toe. The man's head was down, made no attempt to look at anyone. He stood unmoving when Fidel's fist smashed into his face, driving him into the wall. Then he was brought to the center of the room and made to get onto his knees. Screaming with rage, Fidel took a length of black rubber, possibly cut from a tire from a guard, and lashed it as hard as he could into the man's face. The prisoner did not react. He did not cry or even blink an eye. His failure to react seemed to fuel Fidel's rage, and again, he whipped the rubber strip across the man's face. Again, and again, and again, a dozen times. Fidel smashed the man's face with the strip. Not once did the fearsome abuse elicit the slightest response from the prisoner. His body was ripped and torn everywhere. Hell cuffs, that's those, those cuffs I told you, the ones that don't move, appeared almost to have severed the wrist. Strap marks still wound around the arms all the way to the shoulders. Slivers of bamboo were embedded in the bloody shins, and there were what appeared to be tread marks from the strip across the check chest, back, and legs. Earl Colbeau died as a result of those tortures. Wait a minute. You said his body didn't react. I can't think of like the automatics that it doesn't hit you without you realizing that you would just yeah. swallow. Major James Kassler. I spoke of him before. He was one of the two aces from the other camp when I was in Korea. He shot down eight MiGs. Was another of Fidel's victims. Kassler survived. Fidel deprived Kassler of water, wired his thumbs together. I spoke of that when I was, when I was first captured. And it's surprising how with the thumbs together behind your back, you're practically incapacitated. You can, you can do hardly anything. Wired the thumbs together and, and flogged him until his buttocks, lower back, and legs hung in shreds. During one barbaric stretch, he turned Cedric, another torturer of Vietnamese, loose for three days with a rubber whip. That was the strips from the, what I think were cut from tire, like fan belt, is what it, 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 that type of thing. If you had a a piece of fan belt that was about three foot long, and you're using that as a weapon. <coughs> Kassler was in a semi coma, bleeding profusely with a ruptured eardrum, fractured rib, face swollen, teeth broken, so that he could not even open his mouth. And his leg that had been broken, badly broken, in his capture was repeatedly kicked. After the end of the war, U.S. investigators launched a manhunt for the Cuban program torturers. In the midst of their hunt, investigators cataloged over 2,000 Cubans who were in North Vietnam during the late 1960s. Unfortunately, officials failed to positively identify the torturers that were at the zoo at the time. Today, 
some evidence exists that some Cuban program torturers may be living in the United States. The investigations and pursuits continues. If you wish, you can go on Google, put in Cubans torturing US POWs, and you'll see a number of sites. One of them is a, a committee in the Congress that went into it in depth and has the testimony of Jack Bomar, who I talked about, a Navy uh, man, Bowden, and a State Department man. So you might be interested to take a to look it up. Cubans were not something they were to, Larry and I became availed, uh, aware of it because of the communication that we had. Through so that kid that was standing on another kid's uh, shoulders, looking over toward that, to the stable across the space, and we got the word. They had 10 POWs at their disposal for six months, and then they got another 10 POWs. In the first group of 10, that was when, where Cobia was. The second group of 10, that's where Kassler was. The atrocities reflect on all 20, but as I say, two were singled out. A SAC navigator bombardier, he's the guy that, that uh, was in the place to, in the B-52s and B-58s like that before he got into Vietnam as a backseater in an F-105, what we call Y Weasel, electronic uh, program, and the Korean ace. They were there for a year. And most of 67 was spent in, with, for them in irons or other kind of torturous conditions. I, I can't verify this, but uh, th this is what it is written that a one former POW, and I've met him, met him uh, Digger O'Dell, he alleges that two POWs were left behind in the camp that were broken but alive when he and the other prisoners were released in the 73 homecoming. That they have been too severely tortured to be seen. Their bodies were returned. I was never told not to talk about it, so it wasn't universal, but some of the POWs were told not to talk about it. They didn't want that kind of publicity out at that time. So the, I don't know what, kind, what time is appropriate for that kind of information, but our political leaders determined that. The congressional involvement that I spoke about was under the, chaired by Representative Gilman from New York, a human rights activist. He wanted the FBI to find, find the guys. The request to the FBI evidently went nowhere. We don't know about it. But in November of 99, that committee held hearings, and that's the, the hearings that I told that there is word, words in the congressional record now on that program. There's, there's no statute of limitations, so the, the hunt goes on. About that time, the Tet Offensive happened. We all know that. that. Late January 68, they made the surprise attack all over South Vietnam. So many of the bases like that. The one that affected us mostly was up here around the city of Hue. A fairly substantial number of civilians were captured and brought into North Vietnam. And during homecoming, there were a number of civilian releases along with us 
that you may not have heard, heard of. One of them, Monica Schwinn, just died in, in Germany. She was a, an aid worker, a health worker like that, who was trying to help the Vietnamese people. She was captured in the Tet of Pestis, brought up into North Vietnam, and went through some bad, bad times there. There were three women at the time, she and two others. The other two died. They couldn't, they couldn't withstand it. Communists had rounded up a lot of people, people that had, were known supporters of the me, the American, were executed during that period. Following Tet, of course, it's a, it's a big black eye to our government that that thing could occur. They didn't know what was going to be happening on there. But we, in our camp, were establishing Larry's control. He had, we had gone through everything. We were there, had the communication. We found out about the Cubans and like that. We were receiving information. We were giving response to what David was, was trying to get, ask of us right then. The propaganda pieces ranged in many cases, reading words over the, the, the bitch box, as we called it, or writing things. And one of the big things was that they wanted a biography of each one of us from birth to the to the day that we were sitting there writing a, a biography of ourselves. We know that stuff that we were writing was ridiculous. It, it, didn't, it, was, it wasn't grammatical and humorous in some cases, but we were, what we were worried about. It was not really directed at the US. It may be directed at the fourth, third world who only knew that we were writing these things. So, so we were trying to control as much as we could. The emphasis that, that the Cuban program had in that camp sort of toned down the, uh, the effect that the Vietnamese were directing at us at the time. So things were a little bit better. And then we received words of early release. I mean, all of us would like to have a release, but uh, in the summer and fall of 68, there were three POWs that, that were with us that had been released, three on the, in February and three more in August. And we considered and we heard some of the propaganda that they read to us over that loudspeaker system, the bitch box, that American military men and one of them was, had been an ace in Korea that would do that. To, I mean, it's, it was a blow that we didn't, didn't need to hear, that they gave up, and they gave the enemy comfort. That's what they did. But they were, they were released early. They came from a special camp, uh, what they call the plantation, where they, they had taken special people that they thought they might have uh, a chance in turning and getting information of them. They had several notable failures at that camp. McCain was one of them. Stratton was the one that you saw with the, the rigid bows, and like that was the other one. And Ted Guy. Ted, Ted was a senior man in, at that time, and he tried continually to bring people up on charges when, after we got home. And our military leaders and our political leaders did not allow those charges to go through. We wanted to charge them with essentially treason, because that's what they did. It didn't happen. There were two more releases after this. There were four, four releases of three men each, or 12 people. What we consider, there were 11 treasonous people and one honorable. One man was ordered 
one of the people at, the, at that plantation to take relief. His name was Hegdal. He was a seaman on a ship out in the Gulf of Tonkin, and in an, a violent move on the ship, he fell overboard. And he was picked up by a Vietnamese fishing boat. He was probably had been in the service for maybe a year, 15 months or something like that. He didn't know from anything. And he, but he memorized all of the POW's names like that. And we said, we wanted to get those names out. So he was ordered by his senior man in his camp to accept the release when it came, and he did. So he's the honorable release. As I said, it hurt our morale. But the rest of it, 98 into May, was relatively benign in comparison to the time from the Hanoi March up until then. Of course, in November, Nixon is elected. Escape. We talk about es es escape. We did all the time. We did, uh, we did not know that in an adjoining part of our camp at the zoo, there was a section that Larry and I were not really aware of, they called the Annex, another series of buildings. And there was a pair of POWs there that were planning an escape. Escape had been made from a camp known as the Dirty Bird in Hanoi. Now, in, at that Dirty Bird camp, they used, what they did, they found some buildings that they could secure, but they had the POWs outside and around where local people could see what, see them. It, 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 it was an obvious they were, oh, they were there, and they evidently thought that their existence at that point might protect the thermal power plant that was in that same area. So we think they were there as a means to sort of an umbrella to keep that thermal power plant clean. But they were sort of spread out in that thing. And so two POWs were in sort of a separate room by themselves, or a separate cell by themselves. And they escaped. There was no sign of collusion with the others because they had no way of con of contacting them, no, no direction seniors. There were no real seniors there. They were, they were of, uh, they were, the rank of captain, lieutenant, or captain. That, that, that. But they escaped. They made it as far as the river that runs through, the uh, Hanoi, and possibly 15 miles downriver. But they were picked up by local people there, and they were brought back to the camp. Now, in the code of conduct that I went through before, in number three, they say, if I'm captured, I will try to escape. I won't accept any kind of parole, like the, the 11 early releases did, or special favors. They had gotten better food and such. And the other one was in section four. If you come a prisoner, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I'll give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. And then it says, if I'm senior, I'll take command. If not, I'll obey the lawful orders of those imported over me. Well, let's continue. In survival school, they say, as far as possible, when you're shot down, evade. If you are captured, try to escape en route. In any case, the sooner the better. Because once you get into a structured environment, your chances go to really down, really far. The best time is while you're on the move someplace. OK. This, uh, the other potential thoughts on this, weighted the chances. What are the chances? We had committees coordinated with their senior 
officer, where they have to be, whatever camp they were in, whatever building they were in, the senior man had to be coordinated with. Senior man could not prohibit it because the code of conduct required it. Now let's think. The locals in the area, average five foot two, black hair, Asian complexion, the Oriental eyes, and we, five foot eight to six foot two, very tall hair color. Our skins were even lighter because we were born out in the sun. And Occidental eyes. The art environment that we were in. If you're going to go to, from Hanoi in that area to the west, you have 100 miles or so going through mountainous jungle. All sorts of wildlife, all sorts of snakes and like that. And we were, to say undernourished, that's putting it gently. It to the east to the sea, another 100 miles, flat terrain, you're white out, out there white in the open, like that. And you're in the middle of an extremely heavy population. And the population had been promised $1,500 for any man captured. Now, it's kind of hard to get out of that. So what do you think we should do? It's possible. It's demonstrated, the guys that escaped from that thing. But then what? Escape was gallant, but probably foolhardy. The history. The escapes from the north, zero. Because we say escape has to be completed. If they went left out of the, their building, their camp, and they got picked up, zero. Early release, 12. That was the 12 I talked about. South Vietnam is entirely different. I can't really talk about South Vietnam because I wasn't there. I, would, I flew out of Da Nang just a, a few times, and that's all. They had 28 people escape. They had 113 that had been released. I think some of the Vietnamese just wanted to get them out of their hairs and they got, got rid of them or, or wanted, wanted publicity, what have you. In Laos, they had two escapes, 16 releases. In Cambodia, they had 25 earlier. We had POWs also in China some that were released with us during Operation Homecoming. So they had a t total of 30 escapes, 168 releases, but POW deaths, 73, of which 28 died in torture. There were 566 were in that homecoming release on that. There was these are the two guys that escaped from that camp by the power plant. Now, there were 28 guys that, that were uh, captured in the south that escaped. And one of them in June of 66 was Walter Eckes, Corporal of Marine Corps. A successful escape. How long was it there, to, to, Walt? Because there he is, right there. He lives in, he lives in uh, Yarnell. And if you want to hear, hear a story, you've got to invite him. So, but how long was it? Uh, total 43, 43 days. 43 days. But he got out. Of, he was captured. He overpowered the people that, that were supposedly trying to keep him solid and got out of there. In the zoo with Larry and I, continued pressure with the irons, some torture like that with the irons. As I said, the biographical information, the blue book, that, that was the biography I spoke of. A lot of guys would just sit at that table with the, the blue book on it, 
and a pen on top of them and just sit there, wouldn't do anything until I, they finally, either they, Vietnamese gave up or they, they forced them in some way. Larry's order was to refuse to write until forced and not in the extreme, then give them garbage. Interesting enough, the Vietnamese liked stories of families that were peasants. They wanted to hear that your, your people didn't have the wherewithal to, to send you to college and all that, that sort of stuff. So they, they accepted all sorts of garbage from us. As I say, there was another camp that Larry and I didn't know about. On the 11th of May, round dawn, as I, as I told you before, they had in the door a little, what do we call a peephole, that opened a flap on the door and they could look in, they could pass in water, pass in a banana or whatever, had to have you. But they, the door was always locked. One of the torturers, guard, opened that flap right at dawn, uh, which caused us to get out of, from under our nets to bow like that. And he was just staring at Larry. Something was going down. We didn't know. That peep was left open. And uh, when you look out, and you had to be back from it so you weren't obvious about it or they would have gotten after you then. But we could see the guards were excited and they were looking over to, from where our thing, the communication central, across that courtyard toward where the barn and the garage were, where our commun communication links came from, from that side of the camp. Actually, they were pointing beyond those two buildings at what was, we would find out was the annex. We knew something was going on. Same lazy Sunday routine. It was a Sunday. Few guards present, which is normal, was replaced by lots of guards present with a heightened activity and a lot of monitoring through the entire camp. Something was going we didn't know. Just past noon, we got word on that communication link from over there from the garage that informed us that two guys had escaped over there in the annex. This was real bad news because we knew something was going to really bad happen as a result of that. Shortly after the message was received, we saw a vehicle come in Two guys in the vehicle, blindfolded, handcuffs, taken into the torture rooms. We found out that they were Dermisi and Atterbury, two captains. Dermisi knew he was on the promotion list to be a major, but it hadn't occurred. So in the POW system, he had to stay as a captain the entire time. That's how we kept it. I was shot down as a major. I kept my rank as a major, even though my wife received the pay of a lieutenant colonel along the way, and finally that of a colonel. So when I was, so when I was released, I went from major to colonel, never had been a lieutenant colonel. Very accelerated promotion in a way. We figured that Dream East and Atterbury were out maybe 15 hours, before, if possible, that before they were picked up. But that they, they had come out like that, it was in a way where they were in the system, they were de deeply embedded in the system. The Vietnamese believed there was a tremendous amount of organization, communication, because the the escape was done quite professionally in the sense that they got out of that, their building and out of the, the initial camp environs. But they didn't get much further than that. We got the word, of course, that additional POWs. That would be other people in the rooms where those two guys came out of. And 
Maybe some others. We didn't know. We was proved later that, that, yes, indeed, other guys from the annex were brought over now. Now this is the, uh, an aerial view. This is that pool hall building where Larry and I were. We were in this room five in the front half of that building. That was the stable with the Cubans had, the pigsty, the library. There's the barn and, and the garage. And these were the things across the wall. There was a wall here that had a gate. The gate was right opposite the, the break between these two buildings. And out of this building here is where the two guys came. So these, these guys had to have some kind of orders to escape. That's the Vietnamese thinking. The, the guys communicating with the, the garage were in, over in this building here. Cross. So when the Vietnamese went into this thing, they took the senior man out of each of those buildings and put them through torture. And I mean torture more than I'd experienced. They found out about the communication links. The whip cracks, this is where we are right now. You could hear the whip cracks even though the screams were loud. They started that afternoon and night and just kept on and on for four weeks, just continuously. And we knew, Larry and I, that eventually they were going to get through that nice communication central system that we had, and they're going to find, uh, eventually come to us. So, aftermath. V indeed, through that torture, discovered all of the communication that we had, where it came from, and where it was going to, like that. They got people to admit things that, that had never happened, but when a guy gets to a point that he has to say something, he says something. So they came up with everything. There were some people not being published. Even so, there was a, a lot of uncovered communication. Some thought that this was the, the beginning of a, a sort of a, a break in the torture. Really, it's because they had too many people involved in too many spots where they were conducting torture. They didn't have time to bring other people out and do anything with them like that. Within three days after the escape, we had lost all communication on the other side of the camp. Still had it on our side. That zoo room that had the, the communication across into the annex the two guys that were in there were taken out, and they were really put through the mill. They were the key between the two camps. The senior camp where we were were majors, like the, some captains and majors, more or less senior to the people that were in the annex. One of the two guys died in the torture within two days of his capture. About two weeks later, later, even though they were still looking in, I was giving Larry dirty looks, he was taken out and requested to do some things. He recorded a tape to be used on the, on the camp bitch box system like that. During the event, which one of the more intelligent of the, and I use that loosely, of the interrogators, said, don't rush it. He says, I'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks, letting him know that it was coming his way. Whipping and screaming continued. Seemed to go in cycles. One group of guys went through it, and then they bring another group in. So a lot of screaming at the beginning was toned down. But it continued. Each group had its turn. With us, 
starvation rations, but you didn't have the appetite anyway. So it lost a lot of weight during that period. Stress will do a tremendous amount. If, if you want a good diet, get a, be in a highly stressful situation and just eat normally, you will, you will lose weight, I'll tell you. We didn't eat that much, so we had a massive weight loss. Escalating stress. The only relief we really had was at night. Was you had the gong to get you up in the morning, get out of your, from under you to underneath the mosquito net, and then the gong at night, get under the mosquito net, go to bed. Light is on in the room all the time. So this sort of sketch comes from another room there. But essentially that was the way it is. We were on a plank bed on a little straw mat that was about a, a sixteenth of an inch thick, if that, and uh, under our net. The light would be on like that, but we're safe. I mean, we're out of it. Oh, it's good. So that's the only time you could relax. PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I am diagnosed that I have post-traumatic stress disorder. On June 12th, I've been under the nets for about an hour when I heard the keys rattle at the door lock, the door slammed open, and the guards were there. I almost had an attack right there on the spot. I don't know if it was a heart attack, a panic attack, it's probably a combination of both. But I mean, it hit me solid. To this day, when I hear keys like that, I, I can feel, feel something. Larry was pulled out. Alone. After 44 months together, I was never to see Larry again while I was in the, in the POW camp in, until the very last couple of days when we were back at the Hanoi Hilton ready for release. Next day, I was taken to a quiz by a, a rather, easy, in some ways, easygoing interrogator. We call the, the rat, but since there were so many rats around, he was the zoo rat because they had a, they had a rat at the, uh, at the Hilton and they had one at the Hilton. Uh, these are all different interrogators. He just worked on his stuff while I was sitting at the floor leaning against the wall. I probably looked pretty bad like that. After three or four hours, he just sent me back to my room. But this time I was kneeled on the, on the cement floor with my hands raised. And I was supposed to stay that way continually. I'd let them down every once in a while, but they were monitoring, and so I had to get them back up and like that. That's number five cell was on the end of the building, so there was a corner, a corner of that building that guards could come around and look into in my thing where the people in the room next to me wouldn't be able to clear me and, to, and let me know that someone is coming. So I had to stay pretty much that way as well. I knew I was being softened for what came next. And I could hear what was happening and what was next. I got the word about Larry. He was taken to the backside of that uh, thing from there, the pool hall around and into that little cubicle there. There was nothing in that except dirt, filth, and like that. It was just a little cubicle. It could have been a closet or something like that. But he was dumped in that in irons. 
there, there happened. I had been in that that room at one time during some of the pressure moments. And the back side of that thing was a screen, and somebody had cleaned off a section of the screen in the form of a cross. And early in the morning, like that, when the the sun would first come up, you'd get the scene, and there was the, the a cross sitting there, like that. As the sun rose, it went away again. It was there for us for just a moment. But Larry was sitting there in irons during that period of time. No sleep, irons, no food, had a cup of water, continued through the night, no sleep. Two days later, on the anniversary of his capture, June 14th, he was moved from that from that thing around into one of these rooms or one of these, I don't know which one, but two or one of the rooms. He's supposed to, they didn't take the leg irons off, he had to walk in the leg irons from, from one place to the other. Neil in the irons, hands over the head as I was at the time. He could hear the whipping and the screaming as it was going on in neighboring rooms. And after about five hours, they came. Pajamas bottles were pulled down. He was kicked over onto his stomach. Guards then stood on his two hands to keep him in his position, while other ones went after him with those, those whips. During the period of time that this was happening, he was given a minimal amount of soup, bread, or whatever. He had to stay alive. They, he needed to be punished, and he needed to be alive to be able to, to understand what was happening. He was either, when they left him alone for a while, it was up on his knees, hands raised, guard there with a bayonet. The quizzes was falling by more and more beatings. No sleep. After three days, he, he tried to admit anything, anything, anything at all, to get out of it. He was whipped to it in consciousness, brought back, repeat. Unconscious, brought back, repeat. The camp commander there, who had the ruling over both that zoo and the annex, he had been relieved of duty. He had failed. And so, all the other V officers, they were under the, under the threat, their election. You can imagine how they felt at that period of time. Larry's policies that he had put out, and when we tap on the wall and put them out, you had to be rather specific. It wasn't just that odd quote, you had to make sure that the word got out in, in concise phrases. All of his things that he had sent out were repeated back to him that they had gotten from people that they had tortured along the way. Larry tried breaking a, one time, he's close enough to a window, he broke it and tried to use the glass to cut his wrists to commit suicide. They stopped him. The interrogator says, says, we'll let you die, but not fast, slow. If you're going to die, we'll make it slow. They put him in the, that rope trick before, and this time, this is what they, what they did to him. Not only did they put him around putting those elbows together, but then they took the arms from down behind you and then pull them up and over your bank, back and actually could bring them down to where they had. If you had irons on, they could put your head down to the irons. You can imagine what that did to the arms and spine of the guy that was happening to. Committed 
up to July and August. He thought at times he was actually insane. He had num numerous hallucinations like that. And in his book, if you ever get a chance to read it, he goes into some of it. He came up with things that never happened. We didn't have an historical committee, but he admitted to one. Athletic committee, communications, a car buying community. But when we were really going to be released, a car buying. Investments that we were going to do. The re we have to have a reunion, so they had a committee for that. Charitable committee and a committee for airmen's promotions. We had airmen up there with us, and we wanted to ensure that they get promoted. And matter of fact, three of our, the airmen that, that we have were given battlefield commissions while they were there that some of our brass at home tried to refuse. And the senior man in our old POW group went from one level of command to the next. He actually eventually went to President Nixon. And President Nixon's the one who confirmed the promotion of the three men that we deemed promotable. And they were promoted to, to the rank of second lieutenant. Uh, and two of them uh, retired as captains. And one of them had been a command master sergeant. And with his rank as a, as a uh, officer also, his uh, retirement pay was not was a quite a bit better because of it. Larry's buttocks had been flayed, dried blood was adhering to his clothing, like that. From kneeling on it all the time that with the irons, the knees were so swollen and infected. He said in his book that they looked like balloons, like that. And at one time he was in there with the zoo rat, the one that I had been with, and the zoo rat ordered him on at his knees when after he came in. The pus-filled balloons burst, and all sorts of stuff went all over the place. And the zoo rat, he got sick, left, left like that, ordered him to clean it up like that. And in August, they removed the irons from one leg. So when he walked around, he was dragging the iron with the other, with the stirrup, the other, Empty stirrup on there, you could like that. Meanwhile, with me, I was on my knees, as I said, waiting my turn. After a month of torture, the guy that had been the communication link with the annex, the one that was in the garage, one of two there, Red McDaniel, he's a tall man about six foot three. He was a standout baseball player to, before he got into the Navy, like that. Good all-around guy, like that. He was dumped there, back there in the stable where the, where the Cuban program had been, in a room. And as the SRO now who, in that building, who actually was the next ranking guy to Larry, was so now with the ranking SRO for our zoo camp, they dumped him in on him. And he sent out a message from there, do not resist. It says do no, do not resist. Do what it takes to avoid torture. <coughs> he was justifiably afraid that more than just Atterbury would die and die soon. What was going on? No, I'm on there on my knees. I got that word. And the question to me is, should I give in to it to avoid torture? I thought about that for several more weeks. One of my knees were really, really hurting, I'll tell you. As I said, I was on the corner. The amount of cover provided by the people in the next room it was hard to get off my knees, to slouch down or whatever, to lower my hands. 
It was tenuous. Then it happened again. The same thing that when Larry, the keys. It happened, it wasn't at, at dawn, or it wasn't at night or like that. It was during the day, but the keys were there and the door opened. This is it. I know, I know it's happening. Turn gave, gave me the signal to wrap it up, the same kind of signal to get when you're going from one room in the camp to another room in the camp. Wrap it up. So here I'm going to carry my own care, my mat, blankets, cup, clothes, and my individual anti-hot device. That's what the Vietnamese called a fan. Well, they gave us a bamboo fan, and that was an anti-hot device. With the gear in my arms, I was taken around, and not to the, not to over here or to there. But they took me out of there and marked me around there and in the back of the pigsty. I said, "What the heck is going on?" I mean, it, it, I. I was in, in shock the entire trip, but I was, it was strange. They opened the door and there were three guys in this room and they had me go in there. They had three beds in there. But I was a fourth guy. I was stuck in there. What the heck is going on? I didn't know. We were all left there, the, the four of us, like that. I did not know what could happen. I'm not on my knees. There's no guards at the peep looking in, screaming at me or anything. What the heck is going on? I got suspicion. With my history, of course they knew as soon as they heard my name what would happen like that. I mean, these guys are all of a sudden really nervous because here's a guy that's under the gun in there with them. Dave Everson, Jim Haichu, and Tom Sterling. Dave was a, a fellow 105 pilot. He came out of Japan and flew out of Thailand as I, out of Okinawa, out of Thailand. Haichu had just come in from other military pursuits through accelerated training as a 105 pilot. And Tom Sterling was one of these backseat guys that was doing anti-electronics uh, anti electronic things, trying to find the, the surface-to-air missile sites and attacking them. Quite diverse backgrounds. Um, so all of them were carried 18 months after I was. They had all sorts of information that I didn't have. This is something different. All three had been tortured, but relatively left alone afterwards. They got the first amount of torture out of the way, but then after that, they were relatively left alone. And now I was with them. One of them looked really bad. I mean, he was sort of like a, you'd say a guy from Dachau. He needed, he, he needed some building up. So the first meal that they gave us, I tried to give him some of my food. He says, you really need this, like that. So what did he do? He pushed it back at me. He says, I needed it more than he did. <laughs> Wait a minute. I looked at the other guys, and they said, yep, you look worse than he does. So that was the start of what that DOD book calls the, uh, the good guy era. The Northern Prisons, 1970. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we'll talk about next week. So if you have questions, please. How did you know what date it was? How did well, the Vietnamese were uh, carried on on a rigid schedule. So Sundays for them were Sundays where they had to sit in, and listen to people talk to them, all sorts of 
Uh, they, they got more propaganda than we did from, from the Vietnamese. So it's surprising when you have nothing else going on, just little things that, that you can tie on to can give you a feeling of, of connection. And you, can, and you can get a calendar. So we figured, figured out everything. And some of our guys that were up there had been, well, they were professors at the Air Force Academy or Naval Academy like that, uh, highly intellectual. That, I mean, we had a lot, and that we were all essentially college graduates except for some of the, uh, the uh, airmen that had been shot down with us. But we did quite well. <laughs>